टुडे वी हैव अनदर क्लिनिकल मीटिंग मंथली क्लिनिकल मीटिंग वेयर ऑल जूनियर पीजीटीज एंड जूनियर ईएनटी सर्जेंस कैन प्रेजेंट इन आवर प्लेटफॉर्म एंड वी हैव विद अस आवर थ्री जजेस आई वेलकम आवर जजेस डॉक्टर दीपंकर मुखर्जी सर डॉक्टर शुभजीत बनर्जी सर एंड डॉक्टर उत्पल जाना सर दिस इज ए कम्पिटिटिव सेशन सो ऑल पार्टिसिपेंट्स हैव एट मिनिट्स टाइम फॉर प्रेजेंटेशन फॉर देयर प्रेजेंटेशन एंड आफ्टर देयर प्रेजेंटेशन जजेस विल आस्क क्वेश्चन दे हैव टू एंसर इट एंड ऑन हुईच बेसिस जजेस उल गिव यू स्कोर्स सो देन फ्रॉम द ऑडियंस वी कैन हैव डिस्कशन ऑन द टॉपिक ऑडियंसेस कैन पार्टिसिपेट इन डिस्कशन एंड गिव देयर ओपिनियन एंड थ्रू आउट द इयर वी ऑर्गेनाइज थ्री और फोर क्लिनिकल मीटिंग्स दिस इयर वी हैव ऑर्गेनाइज Uh, with this one three clinical meetings among all the participants uh, the best presentation and the second one runners up will get certificate and medal uh, uh, in the name of dr jn gurtu sir uh, which will be given during our annual conference i'm calling uh, dr can hear el who who now kcl ji ha kcl ji ha and her topic is aspergillioma mimicking a rhinos orbital malignancy okay uh, all the participants please note that you will start after Hello. there is ring of one bell and we will uh, give another bell at the uh, at 30 seconds before uh, the time uh, at 7 minutes 30 seconds time and the final bell will be given at 8 minutes time so try to finish your presentation within 8 minutes you please start Uh, good afternoon respected faculty seniors and everyone present here today i will be doing a case report on aspergilloma mimicking a rhino orbital malignancy so the patient is a 56 year old post menopausal woman who is a homemaker with no history of comorbidities she came to the opd with complaints of progressive right sided nasal obstruction for the past 6 months associated with progressive decreased sense of smell right sided cheek swelling for the past 3 months right sided diffuse toothache for the past 2 months and right sided nasal discharge with occasional blood stains for the past 2 months Uh, on examination the patient was found to be pale but she had no signs of ictus cyanosis clubbing and lymphadenopathy on local regional examination there was a loss of the right nasolabial fold but the nasal architecture was within normal limits on anterior rhinoscopy a fleshy vascular mass occupying the right nasal cavity was seen which was insensitive on touch and uh, bled on probing Uh, on posterior rhinoscopy the mass was seen in the posterior part of the nasal cavity uh, on eye examination the eye movements were not restricted visual acuity was 6 by 6 and there was no change in the color vision uh, bilateral tympanic membrane was intact and oral cavity no abnormality was detected no palatal bulge or palatal palsy was seen and no loosening of teeth Um, a diagnostic nasal endoscopy was planned and on dne there was a mass seen occupying the right nasal cavity uh, which was fleshy and it bled on touch however the left nasal cavity was within normal limits in all the three passes on investigation firstly a blood investigation was done which showed a complete hemogram of uh, showed a hemoglobin of 8.3 the blood sugars were all within normal limits and the patient was zero negative Uh, radiological investigation since our diagnosis was veering towards malignancy a uh, contrast enhanced ct scan and an mri were done on the contrast enhanced ct scan you can see a uh, 
hyper dense mass uh, occupying the right nasal cavity and the right uh, ethmoids, uh, also the right maxillary sinus. There was a breach in the floor of the orbit and invasion of the um, extraocular muscles, particularly the uh, inferior rectus. So in T1 weighted uh, MRI, there was a hyper intense uh, heterogeneous mass um, enhancing, uh, enhancing mass occupying the right maxillary sinus, right nasal cavity. And here you can see the mass uh, uh, extending up to the posterior part of the nasal cavity as well with the invasion of the uh, floor of the orbit. In uh, T2-weighted MRI, again, you will see a hypo-intense uh, heterogeneous enhancing mass occupying the right um, maxillary cavity, anterior ethmoids, and the uh, right nasal cavity as well. Again, here you will see breach, breach of the floor of the orbit with involvement of the inferior rectus. So approach. Um, the patient uh, came with an increasing nasal blockage associated with cheek swelling, toothache, and bloodstained nasal discharge. So a diagnostic nasal endoscopy showed the fleshy vascular mass, after which a DNA biopsy under general anesthesia was planned, and the sample was sent for HPE. Initially, the HPE reports showed a multiple tissue covering the surface, uh, covered on the surface by respiratory epithelium, with subepithelial tissue infiltrated by chronic inflammatory cells with no evidence of of, uh, malignancy. As clinically and radiologically the suspicion of malignancy was high, surgical intervention was planned. So these are the intraoperative pressure. Uh, pictures during the diagnostic nasal endoscopy and biopsy. As you can see from uh, the picture, the uh, diagnosis was veering towards uh, malignancy because of the way the mass was. It was fleshy, it was red, it bled on touch. Uh, so the patient underwent a lateral rhinotomy with anterior medial maxillectomy. The uh, sample was further sent for a histopathological uh, examination. Immediate post-operative period was uneventful and the patient was discharged with advice for review with HPE reports. Uh, HPE reports with special fungal stains showed multiple acute angled branching septae hyphae resembling aspergillus species. The patient was then transferred to the Department of Tropical Medicine for further management and was started on tablet voriconazole 200 mg twice a day for six months. Currently, the patient is doing well with no evidence of recurrence. So in histopathological examination, you will see a classical uh, septate acute angled branching narrow hyphae. Uh, the stains used, uh, the standard stains are the GMS silver stain, the periodic acid shift. The special stains used are Fontana Mason and Chrysile Fast Violet. Newer methods include immunohistochemistry, direct sequencing from tissue, and in situ hybridization. So, post operative status the post operatively, the patient has minimal scarring, and on post operative diagnostic nasal endoscopy, the, it showed no signs of recurrence. Uh, discussion. A surge on PubMed on sinonasal and orbital aspergillomas showed only 31 results from the year 1991 to 2020, out of which only 10 cases of rhino orbital aspergilloma were seen, and out of which only two presented as a pseudoneoplastic uh, tumor. This entity is very commonly seen in immunocompromised patients, but uh, India being a very warm, um, having very warm conditions with humid, uh, humidity, it uh, is favorable to higher fungal presence in the environment, so this entity is becoming increasingly common in immunocompetent patients. So the most common mycotic species usually detected in a non-invasive and as, as well as a fun, uh, invasive fungal sinusitis is the aspergillus species. Other common organisms include the mucor and the rhizopus. However, an aspergilloma presenting as a tumor and mimicking a malignancy is extremely rare and its presentation in the clinical uh, setting is hardly seen. So aspergillosis is an invasive disease but can be misdiagnosed as a non-malignant tumor or a neoplasm, particularly when presented as a mass because of its lack of specificity on radiological imaging. If timely intervention is not done, it can uh, quickly spread to the CNS and can be life-threatening, even, uh, can even cause death with a mortality rate of 80%. Correct diagnosis is imperative for early treatment and to achieve a better prognosis. If suspected, a histopathological examination of the sample with a fungal culture from a swab taken from the suspected site and a KOH mount of the specimen should be done. Um, there are no specific guidelines for the management of paranasal sinus aspergilloma. The commonly recommended regimen is surgical excision followed by antifungal treatment. 
Um, the first uh, line recommended antifungal is IV voraconazole as a monotherapy for invasive aspergillosis. Uh, it is usually given at 6 mg per kg 12 hourly on day one, then 4 mg per kg 12 hourly on um, uh, oral forms 200 mg 12 hourly. The al other alternative agents include the uh, liposomal amphotericin B, amphotericin B lipid complex, caspofungin, mycofungin, posaconazole, itraconazole. So uh, the mainstay here is that uh, for um, patients with um, Invasive, invasive uh, uh, rhinosinusitis. The medication should be uh, done only till uh, uh, till the disease clearance is there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, doctor. Now uh, this is a nice presentation, but uh, did you ever consider of uh, giving INC? I mean, intranasal corticosteroid postoperatively. Sir. Intranasal corticosteroids. After operation, I mean after doing biopsy and the excision biopsy. Uh, so, so the patient was uh, given uh, intranasal corticosteroids as well, when? but the postoperatively, immediate postoperatively before the HP ref reports, uh, the patient was on uh, uh, corticosteroids as well, sir. But then after the HP reports were uh, found, then we transferred the patient to the tropical medicine where they started the uh, uh, IV uh, voriconazole. No steroids. Uh, Post-operatively, steroids were given, sir. You should have mentioned it. Okay. Uh, why you think this is a case of malignant one? Uh, what are the features that uh, suspect you that it is a malignant one? Sir, the uh, most common, uh, the features, firstly, clinical presentation. The patient came with a presentation of uh, increasing nasal blockage, then nasal discharge associated with blood stain so discharge. These are the not, not the findings to suspect a malignancy. Uh, uh, on radio in the case, suspect you were malignant one. Uh, radiological findings, sir. Yes. The most common was that it was a heterogeneous, uh, hyper intense mass, which had a, a lot of bony erosions as well. So that was veering towards uh, malignancy. What type of malignancy do you think? Uh, the most common could be a. In this case, what type of malignancy do you think? Could be a, a squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma. So why there is a hyper intense uh, imaging? Sir? Hyper intense visual in the, uh, imaging. Uh, usually, in the case of uh, any fungal uh, disease, uh, there will be a hypo intense with a rim of hyper intense intensity, uh, uh, which show the uh, which shows uh, mucosal inflammation. But uh, that is a very nice paper. Thank you, sir. And I understand that you are actually confusing malignancy by its clinical appearance, isn't it? Uh, by its clinical appearance, it was a proliferative growth, it was a bleeding mass, uh, the age was also conductive. So, you are yes, thinking sir. that it might be a malignancy. Y yes, sir. And uh, also, as per such uh, exuberant aspergillar infections are not common clinically, we don't see it very regularly. Yes, sir. So, you took a biopsy. Yes, sir. And the biopsy did not support your clinical diagnosis. No, sir. Because it malignant cells are not found. Yes, and, sir. And uh, there was uh, no uh, subepithelial infiltration of anything, even uh, fungus you didn't get there. Uh, no, Only sir, the first, uh, the first biopsy uh, did so, not show so, any... So, it did not support you. It was a confusion. Yes, sir. It was not supporting your clinical diagnosis. Yes, sir. Uh, you did some uh, imaging. Yes, sir. And imaging, the, all the imaging that you have done, the CT and the MRI T1 and T2, again did not support your clinical diagnosis. Yes, sir. So, did you have any further imaging which could have uh, at least tell you that uh, it's, it's inflammatory, it's not malignancy. In, in the same line that uh, radiological investigation, imaging. Have you, have you heard of DWI, sequence in MRI scan? Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, could that help you in, the, in Arabic? Because you have done MRI, no? it was nothing extra. You have to just to uh, order for another sequence. Uh, yes, sir. It would have helped uh, further with our investigation, but then in the clinical, in our clinical setting, we do not have that option. And since the patient could not afford, so we just stuck to T1 and T2 weighted diffusion MRIs. Okay. And secondly, you had done an external anatomy, uh, sorry, lateral anatomy, and medial maxillectomy and removal of the mass. Yes, sir. 
But nowadays, all these cases, we prefer to go by endoscopic excision. The same thing without a lateral anatomy. But w what was uh, uh, your uh, logic for going for an external approach in this case? Why didn't you prefer endoscopic excision? So the external approach was uh, done because uh, the firstly it was very extensive and then uh, there was a uh, erosion of the floor of the orbit as well. So um, Okay. Okay, thank you. It's a very nice presentation. And and lastly I'll just request you how do you pronounce your name? We couldn't pronounce your name. Uh, my, my name is pronounced as uh, Techa, sir. Techa. Okay, Techa. It's a nice name. Thank, Thank you. you. Any, any comment from the audience? That was a very nice presentation. Um, but just to take up on something that Dipankar Das said, if your first biopsy didn't support your clinical suspicion, why didn't you take a repeat biopsy? Why did you straight away go for what is actually definitive surgical management without actually knowing what it was? Because if that had turned out to confirm your, your suspicion that it's an SCC, an SCC breaching into the orbit, then you've done inadequate surgery. You're, you're the fact that, I mean, there was nothing to stop you taking a deeper biopsy from inside the antrum. The problem, if you got respiratory epithelium, it means that you've just taken a superficial biopsy. You needed to take a deeper biopsy from the actual mass. Because not just the fact of inadequate surgery, there is actually enough in the literature. If you have invasive aspergillosis, there are several case reports where just giving them IV voriconazole dramatically shrinks. If you look at neurosurgical papers, there's people with invasive aspergillosis involving the frontal lobe. Their IV voriconazole, within two weeks, it all goes away. So you might actually have not required such extensive surgery in the first place. So why didn't you do a repeat biopsy? And if you, were, if you thought it was SCC, why didn't you do the adequate surgery for SCC? That's probably an unfair question at your level. Any more questions? Okay. I request Dr. Jain Guttu, sir, please come and hand over the certificate. Thank you. So, our next participant is Dr. Kattayani. Her, present, uh, her topic is case of recurrent branchial sinus type 2. Good afternoon everyone. I am Dr. Kathiani from Command Hospital. Uh, today I am going to uh, discuss a case of re uh, recurrent first branchial sinus. Uh, my patient is a 13 year old girl who was brought by her mother with chief complaints of swelling over the left side of neck from 11 and a half years and swelling over the uh, behind the left ear from 3 months. On taking detailed history, uh, the mother gave history of uh, the child developing swelling over the left lateral aspect of the neck since the age of one and a half year and spontaneously ruptured with purulent discharge. She was taken to a nearby hospital where she underwent incision and drainage at the age of two years and thereafter she was asymptomatic for eight months. Subsequently, over next three years, she had recurrent episodes of swelling and discharge and she was managed with white bore aspiration and oral antibiotics. In 2018, she was evaluated by an ENT surgeon and she was diagnosed as a case of rec uh, infected brinkial sinus. Thereby, she underwent sinus tract excision, but later on, she uh, remained to be symptomatic till the uh, time she presented to us. On examination, there was a swelling of one and a half centimeter by one centimeter over the left post auricular region, which had purulent discharge coming from it, and there was a discharging sinus on the left side, left lateral aspect of the neck, around two centimeter below the angle of the mandible. Based on the uh, history and the clinical examination, we came to a provisional diagnosis of uh, recurrent brachial sinus and to support and uh, confirm the diagnosis, we uh, subjected the patient to contrast enhanced uh, magnetic resonance imaging, also to look for the uh, presence of the tract and the extent of the tract. These are the uh, MRI images. The first one is the T2, weighted, uh, T2 diffusion weighted image where we can see a Hypo intense lesion in the post auricular region and in the T1 axial section, the uh, swelling can be seen extending medially uh, uh, behind the posterior uh, to the 
deep lobe of the parotid gland which was abutting the gland and on T1 image we could see the extent of the sinus tract which was extending uh, on the lateral aspect of the neck opening up to the surface of the skin. She underwent excision of sinus with superficial parotidectomy. A modified blaze incision was given along with neck, neck extension. Uh, two elliptical incisions were given additionally. One was around the uh, post auricular swelling and the other was the uh, other was around the scar tissue in the neck. These were uh, included in the main in, uh, incision. The facial nerve was identified by convergence technique uh, by, with the help of uh, tragal pointer, digastric, uh, uh, posterior layer of the digastric muscle, the tympanomastoid suture and all the branches were delineated. The sinus tract was found extending deep to the facial nerve and superiorly it was reaching up to the external auditory canal which was cartilaginous part and the upper part was uh, cystic. The sinus tract was ex uh, excised in toto with uh, some of the parotid tissue around it. The specimen was sent for histopathological examination. On histopathological examination, the specimen had uh, uh, stratified uh, squamous epithelium as its lining and cartilaginous tissue was also seen and few of the uh, superficial, uh, so a few of uh, minor salivary glands were also seen. This gave a confirmation of sinus, uh, brinkial sinus. Post-operatively, the patient developed grade 3 facial nerve paresis and 8 weeks post-operatively, uh, it was completely recovered. So, brinkial apparatus consists of brinkial arch, pharyngeal pouches, brinkial grooves and brinkial membranes. These uh, tissue are transient and they develop in the early 4th week of gestation and they, and they disappear by the end of the 7th week of gestation. They contribute greatly to the formation of the head and neck uh, tissues. Uh, as a result of incomplete fusion of the ventral portion of the first and the second brinkle arch, we uh, find brinkle anomalies. These account for about 30% of all the head and neck uh, congenital lesions and their presentations are wide in uh, nature and misleading and it was uh, difficult for diagnosis. The first brinkle cleft anomalies are rarer and account about only 8% of the cases. <coughs> a brinkle sinus has an external uh, or internal opening and may or may not have any cysts connecting to it. F it was uh, classified by uh, work et al. in uh, two, uh, 1972 as type 1 and type 2. Type 1 uh, anomalies have ectoderm... Uh, this is a histological classification. Type 1 has only ectodermal uh, components and type 2 has ectodermal and mesodermal components. In 2022, uh, uh, various uh, cases were studied by A.R. De Souza et, et al. And he gave a classification of the sinus uh, tract based on its relation to the facial nerve. They can be either lying superior to the facial nerve deep to it or in between the facial nerve branches. So when we have a case presenting to us and we have a suspicion of brinkle sinus, uh, the evaluation should include MRI imaging which will aid in our diagnosis and the planning of our surgery. Initial surgery is crucial because uh, the recurrent, uh, recurrent rate after the incomplete excision is as high as 22% but after per primum surgery it is only about 3%. Recurrent surgeries lead to scar tissue formation which will be difficult in our subsequent surgeries as the tract lies in, a deep, uh, in relation to the facial nerve branches and with the parotid gland. So the correct diagnosis and surgical management depend on thorough exam understanding of the embryology and anatomy of the sinus and its relation to the parotid gland and facial nerve. A high index of suspicion for brinkle cleft sinus should be there if one finds any perioral or neck discharge sinus in pediatric cases. These are my references. Uh, how can you uh, minimize uh, the chance of recurrences in your case, actually? And uh, yeah, just. So, uh, by uh, doing imaging, that is contrast enhanced MRI imaging, we can find the tract. Then uh, during, which will help uh, the delineation of the tract during a surgery. The uh, tract has to be removed in toto, and uh, if possible, the surrounding tissue, if there's any inflammation, so that. Uh, there is no uh, tract left behind. Uh, did you give uh, give some dye like that? Sir, so in our case, uh, we did, did not, you give? We did not use any dye, sir. You didn't use? We did not use in our case, sir. 
there are uh, few uh, people few surgeons who have used but in our case we did not use then how can we just see whether the tract is going on uh, did sir, you do a probe test or something like that you have uh, so microscopically also we uh, delineated the nerve and the tract sir we used Micros micro microscope also okay. in our surgery okay okay uh, this is a good presentation uh, the, uh, how these patients clinically presents to you what are the ways of clinical presentations? So they may have uh, swelling in the perioral region and there will be uh, sinus discharging in the anterior aspect, along the anterior aspect of the sternocleidal mastoid muscle. Any other presentation? Any discharge from the ear? Dis uh, sir, in sinuses, we, uh, it will have a blind ending in the uh, or the external audit canal, but if there's a fistula, then there'll be uh, discharge from the ESU also. Yes, if it's also. a fistula, yes, sir. So, how sir. will you diagnose that there is a opening also in the external auditory canal? Sir, pardon? How will you diagnose there is also an opening in the external auditory canal? Sir, oh. uh, there was no discharge from ESU, and imaging also did not support any uh, fistula in the ESU, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. It's a very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Devratan Nandi sir, please come and hand over the certificate to Dr. Kattayani. And I request uh, audience to uh, comment on his uh, hard topic. Just a minute, wait, wait for a minute. Jodi uh, Karur Kichu questions, suggestions, not questions. If any suggestions there, uh, any comment from the audience? Actually, differential diagnosis in a fistula in this region, we should think of tuberculosis also. Because the tuberculosis grand, grand separation and uh, continuous with that may be misleading. So, sometimes it uh, uh, mimics the tuberculosis fistula also. Our uh, next participant, Dr. Siddha Lingas. Uh, his topic is sinonasal mucor with skull base involvement challenges faced with a positive outcome. Good afternoon, all faculties and uh, PG residents. Uh, today I am going to present a case of sinonasal mucor mycosis with extension to skull base. Sinonasal mucor mycosis is acute invasive fungal infection by rhizopus species. It is rare, opportunistic and uh, potentially fatal disease. Uh, it is more commonly found in uncontrolled diabetics and immunocompromised uh, patients. Uh, it has grievous morbidity like vision loss and mortality up to 60% in case of cerebral extension. Incidence is 1.7 per, per 10 lakhs uh, per year and it is uh, most common causative uh, organisms uh, are Rhizopus species and other species uh, like Rhizomycor, Cunningmella, Apo, Apophysomyces, Saxenia, Apsida. Early diagnosis, antifungal therapy and extensive debridement along with strict control of diabetes is utmost required to improve the prognosis. Host factors, uh, Ketoreductase enzyme, diabetes ketoacidosis, rhizoferrin and tergopeltenfos are host factors uh, important play a role in the mycormycosis. Ketoreductase uh, which allows fungus to utilize ketone bodies thrive in acidotic and uh, high glucose environment. Diabetes ketoacidosis, it impairs chemotaxic and phagocytic activity uh, of neutrophils. Rhizoferrin, uh, it is present in fungus which binds to iron, forms a rhizoferrin uh, complex. Iron is available for fungal growth. Tergopeltan fossa, it is main reservoir of disease and via spinopeltan uh, foramen acts as a pa passage for disseminating infection. Pathophysiology, tendency to grow into vessels and lymphatics, formation of mucor thrombi which leads to ischemia, infarction of the affected organ and spread into the orbit and adjacent uh, paranasal sinuses and even extension into the intracranially via directly vessels or uh, direct extension. Some article shows most commonly involved cranial nerves in mucormycosis are second followed by fifth cranial nerve branches. 
Involvement of cranial nerve seventh and uh, twelfth nerve is very rare, and its pathogenesis is not well understood. This case is of rare occurrence in literature, and our case provides one such example. And involvement of cranial nerve third, fourth, and sixth also uncommon. It is due to cavernous th sinus thrombosis. Skull base and intracranial extension. Involvement of the cranial nerves signifying intracranial extension generally carries poor prognosis. Imaging, uh, however, allows early identification of cranial nerve involvement and exact delineation of the spread of infection. CT scan shows membrane or periosteal thickening and bony disruption. Foci of hyperdensity in the affected sinus, highly suggestive of fungal disease. MRI has Important role when extension into the skull base, brain, orbit, cranial nerves, involvement. Usually, cyanonasal mycormycosis presents with back uh, necrotic HR tissue on nasal endoscopy and uh, purulent exudates. Uh, on MRI, black terminal sign is the pathognomonic sign of cyanonasal mycormycosis. Coming to our case, 53 years female, case of vitiligo and newly diagnosed diabetes mellitus. Presented with bilateral nasal discharge, depression of dorsum of nose and deviation of angle of mouth for 15 days only. History of a painful history of painful non-healing ulcer, size of 0.5 into 0.5 centimeter in hard palate, incidence in onset progressive, not associated with bleeding. On examination, eye is normal, extraocular muscle, full and free movement. On examination of nose, dorsum of nose uh, collapsed and uh, palpable right level uh, second and uh, uh, palpable right second uh, lymph node level and uh, 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 there was uh, facial nerve palsy of uh, Hausbergman grade uh, 7, left uh, facial nerve uh, palsy and right hypoglossal nerve uh, palsy. On diagnostic nasal endoscopy, Bony and cartilage septum eroded. Large septal perforation with crust was present. Uh, polypodal tissue in middle meatus, ethmoids with necrotic tissue in spinoid. Spinoid, bilateral ethmoid, and nasopharyngeal wall. On examination of ear, uh, we were found uh, left OME was present because uh, mass extending into the nasopharyngeal, uh, uh, nasopharynx and obstructing the left eustachian tube. And on examination of cranial nerve, all cranial nerves are normal except 7 and uh, 12 cranial nerve. Uh, left facial palsy was there and uh, right hypoglossal nerve palsy was there. We had worked for CECT base of skull to T4 in which peripheral enhancing collection seen in left uh, ITF and uh, tergopeltan fossa heterogeneously Enhancing soft tissue in bilateral maxillary sinus, erosion of posterior lateral wall of maxillary sinus was found. Uh, in CECT, right, pa right parak level region involving hypoglossal with encasement of right hypoglossal uh, nerve was uh, present. We had done C CEMRI brain in T2 weighted image, altered signal intensity, bilateral maxillary sinus right frontal sinus and anterior and posterior uh, ethmoid and spinoid sinuses are involved. Patchy restriction of diffusion in left maxillary sinus and infratemporal fossa. Especially we had done diffusion weighted image uh, which shows hyper intensity seen in left maxillary sinus in restriction of diffusion. We had in diagnostic dilemma uh, uh, a granular versus a disease versus mycormycosis. Uh, all investigations are negative for granular motor dis uh, uh, disorders and we had planned for CT guided biopsy from tergopeltan fossa and, uh, 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 and we uh, sent for KOH mount fungal culture, fungal culture which was suggestive of cyanonasal mycormycosis. We had done uh, surgical and medical management both. Uh, she had underwent endoscopic transnasal, transmaxillary, transterigoid debridement under GA and all necrotic tissues of the palate, maxilla and pterygoid fossa, infratemporal fossa were debrided. 
मेडिकल मैनेजमेंट डन विद लाइफोजोमल लाइफोजोमल एफोट्रेसिन बी विच वॉज कुमुलेटिव डोज फोर थाउजेंड फिफ्टी मिलीग्राम ऑन हिस्टोफेन हिस्टोपैथोलॉजी एनजी इनवाजिन वॉज प्रेजेंट एंड असेप्टेड मेकोर माइकोसिस वॉज प्रेजेंट एट पोस्ट ऑफ टेन अर्ली इन्वॉल्वमेंट and combined uh, surgical approach will helps in outcome and uh, house background grade facial palsy uh, converted into uh, six to a second and improvement in hyperglossal nerve uh, our case is different from other cases because because very it is very unusual case with extensive skull base involvement presenting with uh, multiple bilateral cranial nerve uh, 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 palsies as a first presentation of diabetes mellitus in a previously uh, a previously healthy patient usually uh, synovial mucormycosis involvement in ipsilateral which is more common in garcin syndrome and secondary to intracranial abscess and skull base osteomyelitis thank you sir <coughs> thank you uh, dr siddhalingas uh, we uh, have seen lot of uh, mucor cases in the, i mean later phase of covid uh, couple of years back and there was a guideline also later on uh, published by i mean government of west bengal so before doing surgery just jumping to surgery do you consider giving any medical treatment and after completion of surgery do you again think giving some medical management or just do surgery and leave the patient alone this is one question okay and another one is how do optic nerve actually gets entangled i mean cranial nerve 2 okay in this me cord case in sir, your case e, e, sir initially we had started antibiotic also after that uh, we were in diagnostic dilemma the granulomatous disease versus uh, synovial mucor mycosis and then uh, uh, based on clinical findings and uh, images we went for ct guided uh, biopsy from a uh, tergopeltan fossa based on this uh, we had diagnosed and uh, approached the patient sir uh, did you take any covid history covid is covid history COVID. no sir there is no covid 19 history sir this is newly diagnosed diabetes mellitus uh, oh, there was no covid hence this is a rare case and it is uh, different from other synovial mucor mycosis and how long did you give that uh, medical management after surgery sir Just after surgery sir uh, total uh, 30 days we have given uh, how long uh, sir how total long? accumulative dose was 4050 mg Uh, was there any recurrence of this thing no sir there is no Or recurrence sir after uh, 10 weeks of uh, a surgery uh, on uh, diagnostic uh, on a nasal endoscopy uh, it was clear sir there is no residual disease uh, and uh, improvement in facial nerve palsy and uh, right hypoglossal nerve uh, how uh, then palsy. optic nerve is involved in your case no sir there is no optic nerve in involved in this aspects also this is uh, rare and uh, different from other synovial mucor mycosis patients sir. suppose optic nerve is involved what is the result sir it is poor prognosis sir when optic nerve involvement is there it is poor prognosis sir uh, okay okay is a very nice presentation the one question is that uh, how can we explain the facial nerve paralysis in this particular case why there is facial paralysis in this case sir involvement of uh, skull base uh, which But from your ct on an mri there is a uh, facial nerve is not involved but sir uh, some literatures matlab uh, no no literatures sir you have to explain why there is facial nerve palsy in your case but there is no involvement of facial nerve in uh, uh, mri images sir but a uh, clinically we were found that sir so how can you explain it this is the question okay how you will clinically suspect that this patients may have mucor mycosis what is the most important clinical findings sir on clinical examination sir on nasal endoscopy a crusting uh, visually present and uh, what type of crusting that is more, much more important uh, black black a uh, crusting present and uh, there will be uh inferior turbinate usually involved in uh, this type of crusting sir okay thank you sir so, so, uh, very nice case and you have presented very nicely also so just a basic question 
that mucomycosis is a dreadful disease. Sir. So what is the management of muco cyanonasal mucomycosis? Sir, uh, it is based on uh, patient's finding and patient's uh, condition, sir. No, the basic principles. Uh, amphotericin B, sir. Liposomal amphotericin B. Uh, uh, sorry? Liposomal amphotericin B and surgical management. Uh, which one is more important? You have to do both or you can just do it by amphotericin B or you can just uh, do surgical management and don't give antifungal. Sir, surgical management is required after debriding, after removing of necrotic tissues. Uh, it will be helpful for penetration of the amphotericin B and it will uh, give good results, sir, comparatively uh, only medical management. Actually, uh, the mechanism of tissue destruction in mucor is embolization of the feeding vessels, yes, arteries. Yes, so if you give amputation B and do not debride the tissue, it, it will never reach there. So both is very important. You debride, it's not a surgical management. You debride the necrotic tissue, made that area more vascular so that your amputation B reaches there. Okay. So it is amputation B that does the trick and debridement is to uh, make this amputation B to reach at the site. This is very important, right? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, again, very interesting presentation, but how can you be sure that the muco is what caused the septal perforation? Now, yeah, okay, because I understand that there is muco found, but you can't really in the absence, at least from the pictures you showed, You'd expect black crusting on the perforation. You'd ex shegulo to ki so oje pre-existing at the perforation chilo tapor mucor hoye gache. How can you? You you can't really stand the perforation as part of the mucor, at least on the basis of what we've seen. Yes. Sir, retrospectively also we can diagnose this sir the subtle perforation. Uh, by this approach we can diagnose sir. Retrospectively also we can. Uh, yes sir. Pre-existing. I think one thing can be suspected because mucormycosis essentially affects the microvessels first to occlude it. Probably the vasa nerve involvement of a distant area. Probably that is the reason which can cause a, a hypoxic damage to the nerve and that is that may be one explanation. I'm not sure. Are you? Are you? Do you agree with me? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Diabetic neuropathy can be. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it is a multifactorial. Multifactorial. That's true. That's true. Any more comments from the audience? Okay. Uh, I request Dr. Shamul Ghosh, sir, please hand over the certificate to Dr. Siddha Linges. Thank you, sir. Our next participant, our next participant, Dr. Ritu Parna Mukherjee. Dr. Ritu Parna Mukherjee. Good afternoon, everyone. My topic is intraauricular swelling in a case of microtia surgical challenges. Our case was a five-year-old male child who presented with a swelling in the intraauricular region left side. It was insidious in onset and gradually progressive in nature. It was not associated with any pain and also the patient had left-sided microtia. Local regional examination showed 2 into 3 centimeter swelling in the left infraauricular area, left parotid region. The swelling was oval shaped, well defined with regular margins, firm, non-tender, mobile, with no fixity to underlying structures or to skin. The ear examination, the right ear pinna was normal, left ear showed pinna with grade 3 microtia. The external auditory canal of the right side ear was within normal limits and the left ear external auditory canal was atretic. Tympanic membrane of the right ear was intact and in the left ear it could not be visualized. 
Investigation. We did a USG of the left intraarvicular region. It showed a hypoechoic space occupying lesion, 2.84 into 1.26 cm with regular margin just beneath the skin. FNSE was suggestive of dermoid cyst. OAE was done. Left ear was referred with peak at 50 decibel hearing loss, suggestive of mild hearing loss. Right ear was passed. HRCT temporal bone findings were atresia of the cartilaginous part of the external auditory canal while the bony part was patent on the left side. Mastoid antrum was rudimentary and the mastoid bone was sclerotic. Uh, this shows the bony patent uh, external auditory canal in, and the atretic cartilaginous part. And these arrows show the swelling. MRI of the parotid region with neck showed a thin walled cystic lesion measuring 27 into 16 millimeter in the left parotid region just beneath the skin. There was deep extension into the left carotid space. The T2 weighted images of the MRI show a hyper, hyper echoic uh, thin cystic walled lesion just, be just below the skin. This image is of a T1 weighted image with a hypoechoic lesion. The operative procedure that was planned was for excision of the cystic swelling. A curvilinear incision was made after, mark, after uh, uh, noting the mastoid tip and the uh, mandible angle of the mandible. The curvilinear incision was made. Superior and inferior flaps were raised. Identification of the sternocleidomastoid muscle on the left side and the posterior belly of the digastric muscle were done. Facial nerve was identified all of a sudden immediately deep to the lesion in relation to the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. The swelling situated was just above the main trunk of the facial nerve and was dissected carefully using bipolar cautery. Minimizing the use of monopolar cautery to prevent injury to the nerve by heat dissipation. Hemostasis was secured and wound was closed in layers. These images show the pre-operative and intra-operative pictures. The curvilinear incision was marked after delineating the mastoid tip and the angle of mandible. This arrow shows the facial nerve trunk that was identified intraoperatively after the excision of the cyst. The facial nerve trunk with its branches and posterior belly of the digastric muscle which lie in the same plane. Immediate post-operative period, the patient had some facial nerve deviation. Post-operative period after one week, uh, the patient, uh, the facial nerve deviation had significantly recovered. The histopathology report showed to be an infected epidermal cyst with giant cell reaction. The surgical challenges faced in this case were every parotid surgery is a challenge and also in this case due to the absence of the landmarks that is the tragal pointer and the rudimentary mastoid tip and the facial nerve lies superficially in children in comparison to adults. The take home message that we can take from this case is study of images of including CT and MRI are of utmost importance while dealing in a case of congenital malformation. Sometimes in cases with removal of epidermal cyst, facial nerve may be encountered just below the cyst without any significant parotid tissue in between. Gentle dissection with minimal use of monopolar diathermy and posterior belly of digastric muscle is a stable landmark for identification of the facial nerve. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Rituparna. But uh, as you have just, uh, you have a word of microtia in your topic, yes, so sir. I will just stick to microtia. Yes, and sir. In which trimester do we get fetus, I mean, uh, affected? In what trimester? Their ears are affected of uh, pregnancy. Sir, there are three trimesters. Yes, sir. First, second, and third. Okay. So we get development begins around five weeks of gestation, uh, and in the 
Okay, first time, Mr. Done. Uh, what may be the cause? Mostly. Sir, I mean, maternal cause. Gestational diabetics can be a cause. Uh, pre gestational diabetics. Uh, or it can be associated with other syndromes such as Down syndrome or Teacher Collins syndromes. Whose? Mothers? No, the child's. Child. Uh, have you ever considered hypoxia of the mother during pregnancy, early pregnancy? So that may be a cause and only some genetic cause, number one. Uh, can you name uh, any other syndromes which may have some, uh, I mean, external ear deformity? We have read it in books. Creature Collins? Creature Collins? And Golden Hair. Down syndrome? Golden Hair. Golden. It was in the last uh, clinical meeting. One presented with Golden Hair, I think. Yeah. Number two. Did you ever consider of doing this microtear thing while you are operating this thing? Uh, what was yes. the age of the patient? Five year old, sir. Five year. Yes. What is the actual, I mean, the age while surgeons consider doing a microtear? Sir, normally microtear, we uh, think of correcting at the school going age. Uh, Specific. It is 8 to, 10. Uh, 8 to 10. 8 to 10. But there are instances where you can do it in third year of their life. Huh? Yeah. Some surgeons may prefer. Okay. What was the, uh, was there any canal atresia? Yes, sir. Cartilaginous part was atretic. Hmm. Uh, bony part was intact as we could see from the HRCT temporal bone cuts. Uh, middle ear uh, structures uh, were found to be the malleus and enclosed were uh, conglomerated structures and no significant uh, dehiscence of the facial uh, bony canal was found. So it's a very nice presentation. So why you are calling it is the surgical challenges? So how many surgical challenges you face during the operations? Sir, in this case, uh, because it, is a paro it was a surgery of the uh, swelling around the parotid region, we needed the surgical landmarks to correctly identify the facial nerve so as not to injure it inadvertently. In so what are the surgical landmarks for identifying the facial nerve? Sir, in case of parotid surgery, the ones we mostly see a tragal pointer. The facial nerve lies one centimeter anterior and deep to the tragal pointer. The uh, posterior belly of the digastric muscle, facial yes. nerve lies almost at the same level with uh, one centimeter approximately super superior to it. Uh, the and other uh, tympanomastoid suture line uh. and the styloid process. So there are very uh, much, uh, there are other surgical landmarks. Yes, sir. Tragal pointer is the just only one. So there are so many landmarks. So why you face surgical challenges? Sir, in this case, the mastoid. You can f uh, see the tympanomastoid suture. Uh, yes, sir. You can also some other. Also, there is some other uh, uh, surgical landmark. Uh, be, sir, the tympanomastoid suture line and the tragal pointer were difficult to be identified due to the microtia. And uh, sir, the so only the tragal pointer is not absent. Yes, this sir. is the most, diffi the most yes, difficulty. Yes, sir. How will you differentiate a derm dermoid cyst and epidermoid cyst? Sir, dermoid cyst is uh, most commonly found in areas where uh, of, uh, infusion of then the. Your uh, radiological diagnosis was dermoid cyst. Yes, sir, FNSC diagnosis was. And FNSC also dermoid FNSC cyst. FNSC was dermoid cyst. Ah. So how the, the how you differentiate? Which one is more difficult to operate? Is it the epidermoid or dermoid cyst? Uh, dermoid cyst. Why? In this particular cyst, if it is truly dermoid cyst, it may be more challenging. So dermoid cyst may have contents of uh, all the three embryological layers. Okay, thank you. So, Adi Dupanna, it was a very nice uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. So, just to tell you, it's not a question that uh, today, this, uh, today is 9th, I think, 9-11 no? is a designated microsia day, world microsia day. So, it is nice that today you have presented this. But what you have presented basically is an infraauricular or a parotid region, epidermal cyst. Yes, sir. Nothing to do with the microsia. No. But do you think there can be a relation between this microsia and this epidermal cyst. Can you, can you put forward a logic? Because your topic is that, no? And, and, and that logic is correct in your case. Just think it. 
how these epidural cysts can develop there when there is a microsia. Yeah, you have read the development of the pina? Yes, sir. So how it develops? Sir, it develops from the first and second branchial arches uh, by the six hillocks of his. Uh, fusion of the hillocks of his result in formation of the pinna. Uh, failure in, uh, in the fusion of any part may lead to any uh, developmental anomaly of the pinna. Yeah, there may be a gap and through which actually the way we get the preauricular sinuses. Yes, we sir. get an epithelial tract there. Yes. And if this epithelial tract gets separated from it and gets embedded in this, uh, in this skin, beneath the skin, it will give rise to an epidermal cyst, isn't it? Okay. So they are related. Okay. So your top, name of the topic is correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Shubhankar, where are you going? It's a good presentation. Yes. But I have got very fundamental questions. In the clinical examination, when there is a congenital anomaly on one side, a microtia, and there is a cyst, where there is a strong suspicion that it can be congenital in origin, why did you spare expensive calf impulse? You did not do that test. You should have done. It can have intracranial connection, isn't it? Yeah. A thing can be there if you are suspecting a, a cyst, a congenital cyst. Number two, what was the uh, audiometry finding? OAE test was done for the patient, left sided was referred at peak at 50 decibel hearing loss and the right side was passed. But bone conduction audiometry can be done na, in this case because yes, the mastoid bone is intact there. Yes, sir. Number three, and the terminal, uh, the diagnosis, epidermoid cyst proves that probably you have missed the punctum. That can also be there. Because epidermoid cyst is usually, mm, it contains it a punctum because it's a, a collection cyst where the mouth is blocked, mm. isn't it? Yes, I sir. think these small points should be taken into okay. consideration. Did you consider using a facial low monitor in this case? Uh, I think mm. it must be considered. Facial low monitoring. And the other thing, the facial nerve course should be studied with the help of HRCT and MRI in this case because microtia is often associated with a very anomalous facial nerve course. So these two things can help us also. Thank you. Uh, I request Dr. Tapunaja sir to uh, present the certificate to Dr. Ritu Porna Mukherjee. Please uh, give them a big round of applause. They have prepared a lot for the presentation, so your acknowledgement will encourage them. And uh, today's program is uh, sponsored by Sipla Nature Division. I request Subhashish uh, from Sipla to come forward and assure us that you will be always with us. Um, thank you so much, doctors. I am Shubhashish, the zonal head of Sipla Nurture Division, the division of Advent 625, as well as our Mucinex 600 and Mucinex AB. So uh, it's our pleasure to uh, stay beside uh, all of you in this kind of uh, platforms. And from my side, it is an assurance from my side that in future ventures also we will be definitely there. Thank you so much. Advent the likhe di <laughs> Their product is Advent. Now our next uh, speaker is Dr. Moonmoon Bhakat. Uh, her topic is uh, glomangiopericytoma, a rare sinonasal tumor. Good afternoon everyone. I, Dr. Moonmoon Bhakat, uh, is going to present a case on glomangiopericytoma, a rare sinonasal tumor. We had a 20-year-old lady who presented uh, in April 23 with complaints of left-sided nasal obstruction and epistaxis over a period of six months, which, increasing uh, over, which was increasing over the past three to four months. There was no aggravating or relieving factor as such. There was associated history of nasal discharge from the same side, and there was, uh, uh, it, it was initially mucoid, non-purulent, not blood stain, but the, however, there was three to four episodes of 
epistaxis, which stopped spontaneously. There was no history of fever or intermittent, but there was a history of intermittent headache. There was nothing suggestive of bleeding disorder. Past history was unremarkable and there was no addiction history, but, uh, and there was no history of exposure to any specific dust or fume. General examination was unremarkable and the ocular status was normal. So we can see as evident from the clinical picture that there was a, uh, there is widening of the dorsum of the left, uh, left nose. Uh, on anterior rhinoscopy, a mass was seen filling the left nasal cavity, which, is, uh, which had variegated surface. On probing, it was, uh, the mass was soft in consistency. It couldn't be probed all around. It was insensitive to touch and it uh, slightly bleeds on touch. So we went on for investigation. A contrast enhanced CT scan was uh, done, uh, which showed uh, the, we showed the tumor, uh, we showed a mass involving the, we showed the mass involving the left nasal cavity also in the uh, right, also occupying the right nasal cavity uh, by pushing the septum. Uh, the maxillary wall was pushed, uh, pos posterior maxillary wall was pushed and the right maxillary sinus was clear, spinoid sinus was clear and there was involvement of the uh, ethmoid. So for further investigation, we did a uh, contrast in hand MRI we showed the mass, we showed the mass uh, in the uh, left nasal cavity, the frontal recess and the ethmoidal cells and the right nasal cavity was also, uh, and, uh, right nasal cavity pushing the, probably pushing the septum and the maxillary uh, sinus was uh, mucosal, there was mucosal thickening in the left maxillary sinus, the right maxillary sinus was clear, the sphenoid sinus was clear and the mass was extending through the posterior quana into the nasal cavity into in, in the nasal cavity so we came to a provisional diagnosis of left sided sinonasal mass with the differential diagnosis of inverted papilloma granulomatous lesion rhinosporiodesis or malignant tumor uh, biopsy was then taken uh, under local anesthesia the histopathological report suggestive of a cellular, highly cellular lesion composing of spindle cells. There was no atypical features noted. So uh, to uh, know the origin of the spindle cells, uh, immunohistochemistry was done, which shows uh, positivity for the smooth muscle actin. Therefore, the lesion was, uh, therefore the features were consistent with hematomatous polyp. Then the patient was taken for uh, endoscopic excision and so uh, here we are opening the uh, maxillary sinus and uh, the uh, attachment of the disease was drilled out. Uh, the maxillary sinus was uh, approached by the modified denkers. Nasolacrimal duct was isolated and uh, opened. This was the picture after the after denkers. Disease attached to the periorbiter removed. And uh, drilling was done at the attachment site. So this is the final, front, disease from the final, uh, frontal sinus was cleared and this is the final picture. So uh, the final histopathological report, it was consistent with the biopsy report which shows the, uh, which shows the lesion composed of spindle cells and there was a, uh, there was fair number of vessels uh, which consistent with the finding of hemangioperistomatous pattern, there was no evidence of ATP as seen. It was further confirmed by the immunohistochemistry. As we can see in the slide, there were spindle cells. And uh, the, it was further confirmed by immunohistochemistry, which were positive for smooth muscle actin, negative for CD34 and Desmin and S100. So the final diagnosis came out to be sinonasal glomangiopericytoma. The patient uh, was reviewed in tumor board. And the, as per the opinion of the tumor board, uh, there was uh, complete exc uh, there was complete excision of the uh, tumor uh, tumor so the, they advised as per their advice the patient was on regular follow up using nasal endoscopy and mri nasal endoscopy was performed on the third six uh, third week six week and the third month mri obtained on the six month post operatively so this is the uh, follow up uh, follow up uh, nasal endoscopy of say, uh, in the six month we can see the uh, healthy nasal cavity with epithelialized uh, mucosal linings and uh, there was no signs of clinical recurrence. The same uh, findings were mirrored in the MRI. So, sinonasal type hemangiopericytoma is a rare mesenchymal tumor which arises from the pericytes surrounding the capillaries. It has borderline to low malignant potential. 
its incidence is less than 0.5% of all the neoplasms of the sinonasal cavity. It was first reported in 1942, which was originally classified as hemangiopericytoma. It is noted to occur in the nose and the paranasal sinuses in 5% of the hemangiopericytomatous cases. It was described as hemangiopericytoma-like intranasal submucosal tumor in 1976. There was a controversy regarding its definition, so later the World Health Organization classified it as glomangiopericytoma as a distinct entity in 2005 because of its similarity with glomus neoplasms. It occurs at age, most, uh, any age, but uh, uh, mostly seen in six to seven decade with female preponderance. But in our case, it was a atypical presentation. Glomangiopericytoma is generally localized to the nasal cavity and sinuses, but the skull base extension is uncommon. Among the paranasal sinuses, ethmoid sinus and spinoidal sinus are more commonly involved. The clinical presentations are epistaxis followed by obstruction, nasal obstruction and headache. Our patient had all these symptoms. Etiology is unknown and the differential diagnosis of a submucosal tumor includes solitary fibrous tumor, lobular capillary hemangioma, nasopharyngeal hemangioma, angiofibroma and glomus tumor. The definitive diagnosis is achieved by tissue sampling after complete resection and immunohistochemistry is mandatory. It is an excellent prognosis with complete surgical excision and the post-operative management should include the long-term surveillance, nasal endoscopy or CT or MRI at regular intervals considering the local recurrence rate to, uh, of 17 to 40%. So therefore I can conclude, uh, glomangiopericytoma is an extremely rare and indolent tumor. It has a benign course with low malignant potential it has a as it's a vascular tumor, it has a propensity to bleed to, so powered instruments are needed for complete clearance with minimal morbidity. It should be considered in differential diagnosis of a spindle cell sinonasal mass with characteristics of, uh, uh, if, the, if there is characteristic of spindle cell in the biopsy. It should be reconfirmed by immunohistochemistry and the surveillance is by nasal endoscopy uh, and CT or MRI. These are my references. Huh? Thank you, Dr. Bhagot. Uh, it was a good presentation. Uh, it was a submucosal tumor, you, you told. Can you name some mucosal tumors of nose? Sir, inverted papilloma. And... Um, submucosal tumor in... Uh, do this mucosal and submucosal have some significance regarding prognosis? Uh, sir? Regarding prognosis, is there any difference? I mean, mucosal tumor and submucosal tumors, mostly. Sir, so, uh, mucosal tumors are like inverted papilloma, is a, uh, sorry, it, it's a mucosal tumor. And uh, this case, it was a submucosal tumors. And uh, regarding the uh, prognosis, uh, so this is also benign. Which so one? The, this. With a low malignant potential. Which one is low malignant? It's so a benign one. but uh, with a low oh. malignant potential. How does, differ, then how does it differ from hemangiopericytoma? Sir? What is it? Hemangiopericytoma features sir? Uh, with glomangiopericytoma. Yes, sir. There's sir. two or three features. Different Sir, sir uh, hemangiopericytoma, also known as solitary fibrous tumor. And uh, so it was uh, the differentiating point between the hemangiopericytoma and glomangiopericytoma is the location. Glomangiopericytoma are uh, basically they are mother, exclu exclusively they are located in the sinonasal uh, uh, location, uh, sinonasal area. And the morphologic features uh, on histopath in case of solitary fibrous tumor there is more uh, fibrous component is there but in case of uh, uh, glomangiopericytoma, there, there is more of smooth muscle, it is a smooth muscle predominant lesion. Okay. Thank you for nice presentations. So, uh, after clinical examinations, what was your provisional diagnosis? Sir, in this case? In this case. So, the provisional diagnosis was? Uh, Usually, in case of some angiomatous mass, we don't do a biopsy. So, what findings? in the clinical or histology or in the radiological settings uh, suggest that you will took a biopsy from this mass. 
sir if uh, if there is increase because there might be increased risk of bleeding in case of uh, like uh, vascular tumors the patient is presented with um, uh, also mass in the right nasal cavity no From sir the mass was in the left nasal cavity but it was pushing the septum uh, it was occupying the right nasal cavity maybe pushing the septum pushing the septum hmm. so whether septum is resected or during operation or not no sir the septum was not uh, uh, eroded in this case but from the post operative picture in the mri there is no septum uh, sir uh, maybe uh, this uh, like you can see the uh, post operative mri ekta card diyeche bola ache what are this maybe just see okay okay okay, okay, okay. Huh. so in the um, endoscopy we can see the septum ओके ओके सो मुनमुन नाइस केस आई शुड से क्वाइट अ रेयर केस एंड इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग अबाउट दिस केस ग्लोमनजियो पेरिसाइटोमा इज नॉट एन हेमनजियो पेरिसाइटोमा इज नॉट अ ग्लोमस जुगुलर यस सर इट इज कॉल्ड ए क्लाविंग ऑफ द टू समथिंग इन बिटवीन यस सर बेसिकली बिनाइन ओनली रेकर्स इफ देयर इज इनकंप्लीट एक्सेशन So yes, complete excision is the no, key this, point in management. Yes, sir. But in your case, there is only I, I, I'm uh, 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 frankly speaking, I have no idea about. I have never seen this case. But only thing these cases normally do not present with bleeding. Epistaxis is normally glomerulopericytomas are the presenting feature. They present as a mass, as a polyp. That as Dr. Jana was really asking you that what made you to take a biopsy, because You, uh, you just uh, it clinically presents as a polyp and do it you operate it as a polyp and then the post operative biopsy report it comes as this but it is a very and thank you for sir in case this. of like vascular tumors if uh, uh, if we did a like before doing the definitive surgery a biopsy is a uh, a biopsy is done yeah if you take a biopsy it is always good even if it is a polyp hmm. you take a biopsy there is no harm in it because later you, on you it, it you have a tissue diagnosis and plan accordingly yes sir fine hmm. that is that 100% i agree because if it turn out to be a malignancy then the that, our that, uh, treatment yeah, protocol yeah. will change 100% i agree so do, do you have a clinical picture and nasal endoscopic picture sir a uh, post op no pre op pre op sir it's in the uh, operative video only Like oh, it's only operative video only. It's not in the clinical picture. Yes, anyway, thank you. Any comments from the audience? Uh, was it? Uh, hello, hey, madam. By anterior rhinoscopy or by endoscopy, anteriorly it is uh, visible, isn't it? Yes, sir. The mass. Mass was visible. Yes, sir. Clinically. On anterior rhinoscopy. Yeah. So why you have kept uh, what is that called fungal infection as a differential diagnosis? sir because um, it could uh, uh, the presentation is uh, uh, before it is a soft tissue mass yes sir and that fungal infection that is i mean it has got specific uh, uh, clinical sport. findings yes sir so why you are bringing that in your differential diagnosis so because of the that is also very vascular yes sir and and did you do uh, uh, ct scan with contrast yes, sir CT scan with contrast you did earlier. Uh, MRI, MRI. So it was contrast, contrast CT. With contrast you did it. Yes, sir. So it was, uh, it was looking like very vascular mass. Yes, contrast sir. Contrast was taken. Yes, sir. So in that case, uh, why you have uh, not clinically diagnosed as Dr. Uh, Mukherjee was telling? What is your clinical diagnosis at that? You could not tell that. you have said differential diagnosis but you must make a 
definite diagnosis, which might be wrong. But in all cases, you first make a differential, not differential, but a diagnosis and differential diagnosis. And in this particular case, you should not put that uh, uh, fungal infection in, the, in this, because that has got specific findings. Yes, sir. Isn't it? So what was the diagnosis? As Dr. Mukherjee said, you could not answer. What is the clinical diagnosis? Sir, diagnosis. Final diagnosis. Not final. Clinical diagnosis may be wrong. Each and every case, whatever you see, you must make a diagnosis. Yes, sir. It may be wrong. Ultimately, it may come wrong. But first, initially, you must make a provisional diagnosis, then differential diagnosis, or that provisional diagnosis may not be true. Sir, uh, By that way, you will develop the uh, sense of diagnosing the case. The cl clinical eye will be uh, more uh, focused. You can So in each and every case, whatever you see, you first make a provisional diagnosis. You, you have not done it in this case. Sir, uh, you have not done it in this case. Thank you for uh, comment, sir. <laughs> Don't be nervous. These are all for discussions and for your knowledge. Okay, so all the participants, uh, you can learn from here. And uh, we are proud that we have with us Dr. B.K. Rajachadri, sir. Who is yeah. <laughs> Numbers are given on the questions asked by the judges. But, but these are very important points. So don't forget your MBBS teaching. <laughs> okay. Now I request Dr. B.K. Rajachadri sir to hand over the certificate to Dr. Munmun Bhakot. Sir always attends all the academic programs <laughs> at the age of 88. 86. So our last uh, participant, Dr. Saurav Haldar, his topic is post-oral flap, a less morbid and effective option in head-neck reconstruction. Achha, uh, there is another announcement. We have already announced that uh, we will make a blazer and a badge for our members who are attending uh, AYCON at Bangalore and all interested members uh, and um, at, the, uh, at a subsidized rate of rupees 3000. So the rest of the amount will be paid by our association. And uh, today the tailor is here. So anyone interested can go uh, down to our office and give their measurement for the blazer with payment of rupees 3000 only. Good afternoon all teachers and seniors. Today I am going to present my case study series of post oral flap, which is a less morbid and effective option in head and neck reconstruction. Now what is flap? Flap is a piece of tissue that has its own blood supply and which doesn't rely on the recipient's bed for its survival. Now in my case study, I have used the post oral flap. Uh, based on the blood supply, it is a uh, posterior articular artery based flap and uh, based on com composition, it is a myocutaneous flap. Based on contiguity, it is a type of regional flap. And based on uh, contour, it is a type of transposition flap. Now, this picture showing the uh, area of supply by the post auricular artery. Now, these are the layers uh, which we have taken during the, uh, uh, during the post oral flap. And from superficial to tip, the layers are skin, subcutaneous tissue, fat, then the superficial temporal fossa above and superficial mastoid fossa below containing the posterior auricular muscle and the posterior auricular artery. Deep to this is the innominate fossa which is continuous above with the loose areolar tissue. And deep to the innominate fossa is the deep temporal fossa which covers the temporalis muscle and deep to the temporalis muscle is the pericranium. Now my first case was a 45 years old male uh, who presented to me with a 4 into 3 centimeter square of uh, mass over the right parotid region 
uh, which was on uh, examination, which was a irregular surface and irregular margin mass, and uh, with the involvement of the overlying skin, and uh, the mass was hard in consistency. Uh, after doing the uh, fine needle aspiration cytology, we came to a diagnosis that the mass was a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. And after doing the contrast enhanced MRI scan uh, to see the involvement of the mass around the uh, structures, we have planned for total conservative parotidectomy because the facial nerve was not involved preoperatively. And uh, with the wide local excision of the overlying skin and the selective neck dissection of level 2, 3, 4 of right side. And uh, initially we have planned to close the defect with a full thickness skin graft. But after failure of the graft, we have planned this patient for a post-auricular base flap. So during the stage one of the surgery, we have uh, in the first picture, we have seen, uh, uh, we can see that the uh, incision line was marked and along with the uh, marking of the uh, overlying skin involvement and uh, the incision was also extended up to the midline neck to do the neck dissection. After the incision was made, we have done the dissection and uh, uh, we have also identified the tragal pointer and the posterior belly of digastric. And after that, we have identified the facial nerve. After that, we have removed the uh, total parotid gland along with the overlying skin. In this picture, we can see that the white arrow is indicating the facial nerve trunk. After the uh, removal of the parotid gland, we have closed the defect uh, with a full thickness skin graft taken from the thigh and, uh, and rest of the wound is closed with primary suture. After the failure of the graft, we have planned the, uh, the closure of the defect with a postural flap and after uh, uh, development of the healthy granulation tissue, we have planned this. And in this picture, we can see that the margin is freshened and the postural flap region is identified with the white arrow. After the postural flap taken, it was transposed to the defect and closed with uh, suture. And the secondary defect which was created over the postural region was closed with a split thickness skin graft taken from the thigh. And this picture showing the uh, closure of the uh, uh, defect over the postural region by the split thickness skin graft and the uh, primary defect was closed by the postural flap. And this picture showing after one week of the reposition of the flap and graft. And this one is after one month of the reposition of the flap and graft. My second case was a 52 years old female with acrine malignancy of the skin adenexa over the right parotid region. And after doing the contrast enhanced MRI scan of face and neck, uh, we have seen that the mass was abutting the superficial of the lobe of parotid but not infiltrating the parotid. So we have planned for wide local excision with superficial parotidectomy and reconstruction with the postural flap of the defect as because to make a clear tumor free margin. Now after excision of the mass the defect can be seen here and uh, the facial nerve was preserved which is shown by the white arrow. And this picture showing the postural flap which was placed in the defect and uh, the postauricular uh, defect uh, which have created uh, was closed by the split thickness skin graft taken from the thigh. And this picture showing after one week of the reposition of the flap and graft and this one is the after one month of reposition of flap. So the take home message is postural flap is a very good option for reconstruction in the head and neck surgery. It is easily accessible and it is less morbid. Thank you, sir. <coughs> uh, nice uh, presentation showed up. Was, uh, what do you think uh, of, uh, I mean, that uh, graft rejection occurred in your first case, this parotid one? Sir, what are the, the factors? Graft in. failure occurs most commonly due to the hematoma. So, graft failure occurs most commonly due to the hematoma in between the graft and the recipient bed. So, I think in my case was also the common cause was there. That is the hematoma formation in between the recipient uh, uh, bed and the graft. There may be other associated cause also, but in my case, there was no other associated cause like infection or any other thing. So, I 
um, uh, I can um, so I uh, can think that this is due to the formation of the hematoma. Uh, it was a free flap. The first one was a, was a free flap. Free. No, sir. I have used the full thickness skin graft, skin. not flap. What are the layers of skin then? What? Full thickness. What do you mean by full thickness of skin? The full thickness. Full thickness consists of the epidermis and the total dermis. What are the uh, other uh, reconstructive procedures where you can also use the post oral flap? Uh, other options are, uh, um, beside from the post oral flap, we can use the free no, flap. No, under the post oral flap. Where you, in other cases, you can also use the post oral flap for reconstruction. Because this is your subject. Yes. Post oral flap in headache reconstruction. Yes. So, besides paradigm or skin involvement, in other areas or other, other surgeries, where you can also use this flap. Uh, we can use in case of any neck malignancy, like in case of thyroid malignancy or there where the defect is created, we can use there the postural flap. In thyroid malignancy, you will use this flap? If, if, there, is, if there is defect created over the neck region, we can use this flap. Or we can also use the uh, postural flap in the ear reconstruction. This is not the usual surgery. It's one of the most common surgeries is ear reconstruction. Ear, inner reconstruction. Inner reconstruction. Okay. Uh, it is a very good paper and a very good presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, so, you have, uh, you have worked with uh, uh, full thickness regional gra graft based on the occipital artery, isn't it? Yes, sir. Posterior so, auricular artery. Yeah. Can you use this part of the skin as an island graft? Yes, sir. We can use the island flap, retroauricular island flap, which is uh, we can use in case of different pinna reconstruction, defect then, in pinna. Again, again, based on the occipital artery. No, sir. Posterior auricular artery based. It's, it's, a, it's on the posterior auricular artery. Posterior artery. artery okay. Based. So, uh, what, what is what is the uh, uh, identification point? of the occipital artery or the posterior auricular artery because they are quite close to each other. Yes, the, uh, the first branch from the external carotid artery, uh, the below the level of the posterior auricular artery is the occipital artery. Hmm. After that, the occipital artery giving the posterior auricular artery. Right. So we can identify by this or uh, the posterior auricular artery uh, situated just behind the uh, mastoid tip. Right. Okay, thank you. Any comment from the audience? Why not forehead flap? Sir, because forehead is in front of the uh, face, so if we use the forehead flap, then the forehead uh, region, that is the secondary defect created after taking the forehead flap, which we have to close with a either split thickness skin graft or full thickness skin graft. And there is a cosmesis defect is there. But in case of postural flap, if we use, the postural region is not visible from the front. So we can... Uh, cosmetically, cosmetically better. Cosmetically better. Thank you. What is the reason? Hello, hello, Misha. What is the reason for the failure of the full thickness graft when you place primary closure? What was the reason of failure of taking the full thickness graft as a primary closure from the, at the beginning? Sir, uh, the most common cause is the hematoma formation. So I think in my case, the hematoma was there in between the graft and the recipient bed. That's why the graft was failed. Total pain and a part of it, only the failure is a the, part of it. Yes, sir. The failure was over the split thick, uh, full thickness skin graft region. The primary defect was closed. I request Dr. A.M. Shah, sir, please come and hand over the certificate to Dr. Sourav Haldar. And a chobi. And a car. And a car. Thank you, Soro. Uh, thank you all uh, for attending and uh, supporting us. Our uh, next event is our annual conference. Hope everyone has received the brochure and all the notice. Uh, it will be at Stadel and uh, on 23rd and 24th of December. And uh, I request 
all the teachers of the medical colleges to uh, encourage your students to participate in our all academic uh, events. And uh, there are many categories, PG award papers, junior and senior consultant award papers, poster, quiz, and also there is one uh, research paper award. So I request uh, all to, I invite all to participate in this uh, annual conference. Now I request Amitabhoda to say a few words and conclude the session. Thank you. I think it's uh, very uh, uh, heartening to see such a full house uh, in every clinical meeting that we are organizing and the quality of papers that we are getting. And also initially when this session was started as a uh, award uh, winning session, all of us thought that the charm of the interaction will go because judges were there. Because earlier the interaction used to be very strong. But gradually we have gone back to both judging and interaction, which is very good for learning for all of us because we, all the seniors also learn from your presentation that you present. And uh, I, uh, echoing doc, uh, our uh, secretary's uh, message that please do join all of, all of you to our national con uh, annual conference to be held on 22nd, 23rd, 24th. And uh, the PG students, you must have enthusiased yourself to present again very soon. So to, time is very short, so you should prepare good quality papers. And I'm grateful to all the seniors for gracing the regular meetings here and the judges for their painstaking work. Thank you. Thank you so much.